Hello, and welcome to Spearfish United Methodist Church's online worship. We're glad you're with us, and we'd like to invite you to join us by uh, subscribing to our YouTube channel, uh, following our Facebook page, and joining our Facebook group, the Spearfish United Methodist Church community. Today, we have Hannah Andres in the pulpit, letting us know all about the importance of feeding others. So let's go worship. Our first scripture comes from Ruth 2, verses 5 through 9. Boaz said to his young man, the one who was overseeing the harvesters, To whom does this young woman belong? The young man who was overseeing the harvesters answered, She is a young Moabite woman, the one who returned with Naomi from the territory of Moab. She said, Please let me glean so that I might gather up grain from among the bundles behind the harvesters. She arrived and has been on her feet from the morning until now, and has sat down for only a moment. Boaz said to Ruth, Haven't you understood, my daughter? Don't go glean in another field. Don't go anywhere else. Instead, stay here with my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that they are harvesting and go along after them. I've ordered the young men not to assault you. Whenever you are thirsty, go to the jugs and drink from what the young men have filled. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, we're just so thankful to be here tonight and to worship you. 
and whatever worry, concern, health issue, whatever is on our mind, we just bring it to you. And we know that, that you are there to listen and hear our prayers. Sometimes they're not always answered in the way we want them to be, but that's when we just need to trust in you and that you know, we know that you will give us guidance and you will give us direction. So we just pray tonight that we will feel your Holy Spirit in us and that we will be able to share that spirit with other people. We just ask that you be with the people in Florida. There's such devastation and such loss there. It's almost unbelievable. And we just pray that you will be with those people, be with the people that are rescuing. We just pray that the people will not feel alone, that they will know that, dear Lord, you are with them every step of the way on that journey that they have ahead. And we also pray that you'll be with Hannah tonight as she delivers this message to us. And we just pray that we will feel your presence here tonight. And dear Jesus, be with us as we leave. Give us hope, give us comfort, and give us peace. We ask this in Jesus' name, and now we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield, to you. Our second scripture comes from Matthew 14, verses 13 through 21. When Jesus heard about John, he withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. 
When the crowd learned this, they followed him on foot from the cities. When Jesus arrived and saw a large crowd, he had compassion for them and healed those who were sick. That evening, his disciples came and said to him, This is an isolated place, and it's getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, There's no need to send them away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here except five loaves of bread and two fish. He said, Bring them here to me. He ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves of bread and the two fish, looked up to heaven, blessed them, and broke the loaves apart, and gave them to his disciples. Then the disciples gave them to the crowds. Everyone ate until they were full, and they filled twelve baskets with the leftovers. About five thousand men plus women and children had eaten. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. God, our great Redeemer, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found pleasing in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I want to invite you to imagine a community gathering at a park in late summer, maybe sitting down in the city park by the creek. Think about what you're hearing and seeing, what you smell, what you feel, and what you taste. The humidity is starting to drop. The air is finally cooling off. All the adults are gathered around grills and picnic tables, chatting, watching burgers, brats, and hot dogs cook, listening to the searing from that flame, heating the fat coming from meats. Kids are running around in the big open field, older kids maybe playing catch or football, and the younger kids running and screaming, climbing trees or playground equipment. This is not an uncommon scene to run across in many communities during the summer, especially before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And now as we're emerging from that pandemic, we see more and more of that. People enjoying community and growing with one another, disregarding the realities of political, social, economic, and sociocultural differences, but rather embracing the communities that they're a part of. You might be familiar with this, maybe your own parent, your best friend, your sibling, even yourself. But my dad was the patron saint of feeding people. Anytime my siblings or I would come home with a friend or somebody we were studying with after school or in the summer, the first thing out of his mouth was, oh, hi, can I make you something to eat? Can I get you a grilled cheese or some eggs? Food was an essential part of his making sure that people were taken care of and if there was anything he could do to make sure anyone knew they were seen and valued, it was making a meal for them. And if there's anything that Midwesterners excel at, it's making sure people are fed. And there are two things that I learned essentially from my dad, who was an atheist, and we say agnostic on the good days, in the whole time that I knew him, taught me about faith and what it means to, or even looks like, to be spiritual in any way. And it's that it requires being experienced through feeding people, and being connected to the natural world. Being in relation to place was essential for him and was a major lesson for my life. But more than that, that people needed to be taken care of and nothing about their identity or faith background or national ties changed that reality. The constant refrain from both of my parents was, we're all children of God and we all deserve to be treated with dignity and respect and nothing can take that away from us. Something that was clearly essential in Jesus' ministry was the practice of sharing meals. So often in the Gospels, we see him breaking social customs to share meals with people who weren't considered to have those same values as those who fit with the appropriate mold. He shared meals with tax collectors and prostitutes, sinners, lepers, and everyone in between. And a central part of his embodied ministry was his presence with 
quote, the least of these, which included sharing meals with them, which is an act that posed direct challenges to his own cleanliness according to Jewish purity laws, rituals, and practices. In this instance that we encounter from Gospel of Matthew today, we come upon the experience of a crowd of 5,000 men. This number does not include the number of women and children who were also present and part of the crowd, being fed by five loaves of bread and two fish. And it's hard to wrap our heads around that size of people, of a group of people. I can't really imagine that number of people being gathered together here for anything other than a sporting event like the Super Bowl or maybe a rodeo. And yet, there were 5,000 people who were counted, gathered just to hear a man teach. And who knows how long, of them were some, how long some of them were following him around. At this point, Jesus has taken time to himself. And it's indicated in the text that he's doing that to mourn the loss of his cousin, seeking solitude to reflect on the life and the death of a person he cared about. And a crowd still follows him, desperate for his teaching, for his healing, for his wisdom, and for any remote possibility of physically encountering him. There are some scholars who seek to overturn the miracle aspect of this story, explaining away this incredible multiplication of food by saying that anyone traveling during this period would be carrying their own provisions. So there might be an argument to be made that people just threw in their own supplies as baskets and fish and loaves were being spread around. But I don't really think that part matters, the how of the food multiplied. There's so many ways to speculate exactly how Jesus or his disciples managed to pull this off. But I think when it comes to this story, that dialogue and that academic speculation can really distract from an element that seems pretty essential to me. And that's the part that centers around the approach of the disciples to this problem versus the approach of Jesus when it comes to this massive number of people needing something to eat. What we see in this gospel from the disciples is that they come to Jesus and tell him to send the crowd away saying that they would make it time to get to town or whatever close village to find their own food and eat before it got dark. A very practical, we're done for the day kind of mindset. But what we get in response from Jesus instead is you feed them. There's a pretty stark difference in that where Jesus is so compassionate in his response when we pause to consider how the disciples wanted to deal with these people. Where the disciples seem to approach the situation with an understanding that while this crowd might be gathered to hear and learn from Jesus, they are ultimately responsible for getting themselves fed and taken care of. But Jesus approaches with this compassionate sense of responsibility for the people who have come from who knows how far and have been following him who knows how long to learn from him, hear him speak, and experience an encounter with him, however remote that possibility would be. So there's a big difference in those approaches to this situation. Where the disciples have a mindset of everyone fends for themselves, Jesus has a mindset of being responsible for the people who have heard a call to follow him and learn from him or who may have experienced the Spirit moving them toward him. And therefore, he and his disciples are obligated to care for them through providing a meal to be shared. So this sermon that I'm sharing with you now is one that I originally wrote for one of my classes last year um, on evangelism. And this text is not one typically associated with the practice or the study or the theology behind evangelism. What you normally expect is something like Matthew 28, what we know as the Great Commission, where it says, go therefore and make disciples. And it's a text that's very explicit about going into the world and changing people. But those are also the texts so manipulated in our time 
to allow for harm to be done under the name of evangelism and in the name of Jesus, in the name of our Christian God. And there's no excuse for that. Even so, we have to be able to not only talk about the reality of harm caused, but also realize how we are capable of approaching conversation and exploring options and opportunities to heal from that reality. When we pause to think about what Jesus is saying in response here to his disciples, for once the text is very clear. In a case where the disciples would like to be rid of their responsibility of taking care of people who have traveled so far and so long, Jesus says, no, you feed them. You feed them. You care for them. You feed them. You extend that love and solidarity and sense of being together. It's easy in our own time to walk past someone and assume they'll figure it out for themselves and manage to get what they need to survive, or they won't. And knowing that we won't have to do anything to intervene or change that directly, because we've been told not to acknowledge people experiencing unshelteredness or because we operate in a society that has been built on an over-romanticized idea of what the individual can do for themselves. And because we normalize the narrative of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and fending for yourself and for your own. It's so easy to fall into that really comfortable social narrative that you take care of yourself and your own family and your own people as if all people are not your people. And there's a certain unspoken permission in that to ignore the needs of people we don't know and the people we don't interact with. But this is a pretty clear example in Matthew's Gospel calling us to ignore that specific social contract. You feed them, he says. We are not called to be complicit in the social constructions and norms, especially those of individualism and capitalism. We are called to be in community as believers and non-believers. We are called to not only say these nice words of the Gospels, but to live and embody those same messages. We are called to feed the people, and we are called to operate with compassion for ourselves, for our neighbors, for those we know, for those we don't know, for the housed, for the unsheltered, for this creation, for the two-leggeds and the four-leggeds and the wingeds and all of the living and moving things. You feed them, he says. Feeding may not mean physical food like a grilled cheese or a fried egg, but it can also mean spiritual food. And we are invited into spaces to be able to provide that. We work toward making that decision to respond faithfully or who we choose to ignore when we choose to ignore that social contract. And I hope we can learn to welcome people and creation with the question, can I make you something to eat? Amen.
my name is Beverly and I came to the Hope Center in August of last year. I came here because I relocated here from the reservation. Came here trying to um, have a better life <laughs> and a home for my daughter. The First United Methodist Church, with their work in the community and in downtown Rapid City, started um, kind of seeing an increased need um, with people who were living in poverty and people who did not have homes. They were able to hire an executive director and do a remodel to form a day center, which is now the Hope Center. You know, the Hope Center became a day center for people who are living without homes and people who are living in poverty. Um, there's various things that the Hope Center does and services that we provide. One of the main things that I um, utilize this place for is, you know, my mail. <laughs> got my got my daughter's report card. Yeah, she's making good grades and you know. <laughs> where we're a permanent address for people in the community who don't have a home or who don't have a permanent or stable home. Um, right now we serve over 840 people in Rapid City with that service alone. So it's a, it's a pretty huge need for people to have an address. Um, we also have um, phone service, so we allow people to use our phone number as their phone number. Um, so people can call here and leave messages and that sort of thing for appointments or, you know, landlords or whatever it may be. Um, and they can also use our phone for um, local and long distance calling. We have um, a morning devotional and it, we just want people to know that, that we are a faith-based institution and lots of people love to come and share their prayer requests, they like to share their thoughts, you know, and different things, and it's really humbling when you hear someone who's sleeping under the bridge talk about their faith in God and how they know that God's going to see them through this, and it truly is. We also do document storage, so we store birth certificates, social security cards, other important documentation, so they don't get lost or stolen. Um, we also do um, a lot of advocacy work, um, just getting to know our guests, getting to know their stories, where they're at, what their needs are, and then working with them to get up, get set up with different um, resources in the community that are fitting to them. We have one gentleman who was a chronic alcoholic, and we used to see him in some pretty terrible situations. Well, he has now gotten sober, and he's been sober a long time. And the other day when we asked him, you know, what, what made you get sober and quit? And he said, it was you ladies here. He said, I just really realized that this was a place where I had friends. I think more so than actual jobs or houses, relationships, I think are our successes. Probably the people. Oh, always smiling, always willing to tell you something if you need to know something. Very helpful.
Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you. And give you peace. Friends, let us depart in peace and in love and in joy with our neighbors. May we be joined together in this common goal of service to our God, and may God's blessing be with us all. Amen.